No, I see. I'm okay. I'm uh, you know keeping my keeping my head down and having a good time at home. Really, you know, lucky to be in the countryside and have some space. Uh, we're very fortunate in that respect. So uh, spending a lot of time with my family, which is important, and mm. and also um, and help school my little man as well, which is tough. <laughs> yeah, yeah. How are you coping uh, in quarantine? With your with your family, so it's nice. But how, on the other aspect of things like work and fitness and things like that, how are you coping with that? I mean, the fitness. If I didn't do the fitness side, I'd go absolutely out of my tree. I mean, I've got a bit of a gym as well, so I use that and places. So I've got to exercise. That's a complete and utter. That's the most the biggest focus for me at the beginning when I wake up. But um, yeah, the work side of things, a few bits for the PSA, some voiceover stuff, some interviews. Uh, a few little podcasts mm. bring up stuff. so t- kind of ticking over really but the most important thing for me is spending time with my family uh, which I wouldn't be getting to do at this time of year as I'll be on the tour so great th- being with my little man he's five and a quarter years old he's driving the wall <laughs> in, um, right? so and my wife as well so um, yeah things are okay mate I, we, we could be in a lot worse situation thankfully everyone's healthy and so that's the most important thing well, that's great to hear. I'm glad that your family's safe and healthy, and you are too. What age were you when you first started playing squash? I was around uh, probably seven years old, eight years old. I tried squash for the first time. It was something that was I was gonna, I was gonna try, um, but yeah, it kind of started about that age really for me. Mm-hmm. And when you look back at your time as a junior, what aspects did you enjoy the most? None of it, <laughs> because I didn't really, um, I started playing a few tournaments when I was kind of 10 and 11 and then I stopped uh, completely, I, I, it, was a, it was a bit of a, it's something that stuck, it stuck in my memory and it kind of put me off junior squash for the, the entirety really was, I was standing by some parents uh, at national championships when I was 10 or just nearly 11, uh, the under 12 national championships and they were talking about my dad and myself and being quite, um, not very nice really um, and, I, and I didn't like it and at that age I just kind of said to my dad I don't want to be around this kind of environment uh, with these people um, so it put me off the sport to be quite honest with you I can't remember the exact parents it'd be interesting to know who they were but but um, and then I ended up playing a lot of team sports which I would never change for anything it was fantastic growing up playing kind of cricket football hockey and all those different sports mm-hmm. as well and when did you start getting back into it then um, at university, uh, after I, I had a, I was uh, partial to a bit of alcohol, as most people are at university for the first year. I was pretty blurry eyed and um, drinking a lot of alcohol. And then I remember going down to watch the National League uh, down at Edgebaston Priories, I was at Birmingham University, uh, uh, the university there, and that was my local, so called local club. And I moseyed on down and watched Del Harris chopping up. Uh, Mark Cairns and it was very inspiring for me and I kind of thought you know what I want to get back on the squash court and start training and get fit and make the most of my time rather than just drinking and acting like a, a bit of a, a bit of a prat really <laughs> mm-hmm. and uh, who was your junior junior nemesis then so from your university days gosh I mean <laughs> you know it was it was a bit of a funny one really because university the biggest tournament I played after the national championships when I was 11 was the British universities when I was kind of 20 years old. Mm-hmm. So back then it was probably uh, a really good, a very, very, very top quality junior who was a little bit older than me called Paul Allen, who was kind of the top of the university tree at that time. So he was somebody I was trying to go for and beat. And it was um, it was a little bit of a milestone when I did, but he was a very, very good junior. His brother was a great junior as well. So. Mm-hmm. That was kind of quite a big thing for me um, uh, at that point, yeah. So really my first serious kind of proper tournament was when I was 20 years old, which is pretty insane, but there you go. (laughs) Yeah, wow, interesting. If you took uh, you as a junior and dropped him in the Egyptian setup, do you think you would have excelled even further in your squash career? Yeah, I mean, I was I, the best squash I was playing um, was when I had uh, Wild El Hindi, Hitman Hindi, who got to about eight in the world. He was a very tricky player, very skillful. He came and stayed with me down in Somerset for a good long summer 
and a bit after that as well. And we trained together every day and I was able to play practice matches with him, which were ferocious and really high quality. And that's, that basically is when I was playing my best squash um, in my career at that time because of the quality of the practice matches. So for the Egyptian side, for me, it would have been the practice matches. Playing those those guys day in, day out, out there would have been amazing. There's no secret formula. The Egyptians are not doing anything remotely different to to what the other players are doing, but the intensity and the quality of players in terms of practice matches is mm. absolutely brilliant out there. So it would have definitely helped. I mean, I, any advice I give uh, any 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 player coming through is, is to get those good quality practice partners, you know, so preferably players that are slightly better than you to stretch you a bit more. Mm. Uh, but it's the intensity to really, really get stuck into practice. And if you play a great practice match, it's the best training in my book, really because you, you train everything, you train every element, um, and it's the most specific, obviously, towards competition play. So um, it would have definitely, yeah, but it, it, having all those great players in Egypt now that there are, have been, to play with them day in, day out in a training setup would have been, um, would have excelled me on, yeah, I think so. Mm -hmm. Away from your junior career now, a bit more towards your professional career, uh, did you have any reservations about becoming a professional? Yeah, I, I, I never, I, I only literally, decided I was going to become professional when I was about um, turned professional when I was about 21 it was ridiculously late I never set out to I never set out to be a professional squash player I had a, uh, a cricket uh, career that I was going to pursue I had a, a contract when I was 16 with Somerset and I injured my back and went back and did my A-level so I you know it wasn't on my on my route map to become a professional squash player it was bizarre the way it happened and it was I would say the reason this happened was going to university for the reasons I said earlier. Mm. If, I, if I hadn't gone to university and drank and then kind of felt a bit guilty if I and watched them squash down at Baston Priory, I'd have never been on the PSA World Tour. It's weird. What was your breakthrough tournament then as a professional? Uh, my first tournament I won was in, uh, in Canada, in Ottawa, and it was I played my usual rounds of some very very long matches i remember playing eric galvez he was a top top player back in the day from mexico he's very fit and i beat him in a five games and then i had another five games in the semi and i i played this uh, australian very experienced australian called mike corin in the in the in the final to win my first event and um and i, I, I beat him 17 16 in the fifth uh saved, saved a couple of match balls this was before the 11 scoring so it was over a couple of hours. And I remember serving at his body uh, on match ball for me and, and it hit the bat wall nick. <laughs> oh, you hate, you, you love them ones when you're hitting it, but when you're receiving it, oh, how yeah. horrible. Yeah, the bat wall nick off the serve was pretty amazing at the body. So that was something that stuck in my mind. And then I had a, a really good breakthrough tournament in Pakistan. It was always really tough playing out there. It was tough conditions. And I, I beat a few of the top players on the way I ended up losing in the final of that tournament, but it was it was a decent sized tournament and it gave me a lot of confidence and, and kind of got my ranking up a bit more as well. So yeah, some, some definitely some stages in the career which kind of kicked me on and certainly that I remember. What was your hardest ever physical squash match where the legs just went to jelly? <laughs> oh God, there were so many. Um, <laughs> longest match ever played was two hours two hours 24 minutes with Shahir Razik um, and it was when the 11 scoring came into play and I say 10 match balls in the fourth game it was in very hot conditions in Houston uh, Texas and I, I won the fourth game 28 26 mm. and um, sadly I lost I lost the fifth game um, we had to change all our clothing after the fourth game our shoes our, our underpants our everything we were soaked and he won, and then we had the prize giving, and he was given the check, and he dropped the check, went to pick it up, and collapsed on the floor, and I was still standing, so I was pretty annoyed about that, because I thought, well, God, if I'd have managed to keep you on a bit longer, then he would have, I could have reduced him to that scenario, but it didn't happen. No and then uh, four days later, I had to play uh, the Columbian Cannonball in, in, in Oklahoma. Really hot conditions there. Four days later, after playing that marathon tournament and match, in Houston, and I, I beat him in just under two hours in four games. So I was renowned for playing very long matches. I wish I could have put the ball away a bit quicker at times. <laughs> it was uh, it was quite hard physically and mentally. Yeah, yeah. 
and then, and then in contrast then mentally what what has what was your hardest squash match Gosh, that's a great question, Archie. We've got some great questions in. Um, mentally, it, I mean, the, I think it was when you were slightly nervous of certain players that you might play that, that kind of you're a bit edgy about in terms of their unorthodox or um, kind of excessive shot players that if they hit on their day that it would be it would be tough. I'm just trying to think through. Um, I mean, I, I, do, I do remember coming out... Um, in, in Bermuda in the World Championships uh, having to play Nick Matthew and it was a massive crowd, it was about 3,500 people I think, it was packed and, and walking out to play him um, he was about world number 4 or 5 at the time the atmosphere, it kind of blew my head off a little bit and mentally I found that quite tough for the first game, I was very very nervous and then I settled into it I ended up losing but I played a really you know, it was a, a 4 game match and it was decent mm. but it was just that Playing in front of so many people with the atmosphere, atmosphere so huge. I mean, three and a half thousand people is, is, is a, it's a big old crowd for just to, be, to watch two people. Yeah. When you're when you see football playing and there's there's ninety thousand people watching, they're watching twenty two people playing. Whereas you know, so it's a different you, perspective though, isn't it? It's a different view. So that that was something that's pretty like you know that stayed with me for quite a long time. But yeah, definitely went through. I was relatively strong mentally. It was, I was very intense on court, and um, you know, I I, uh, I used to work myself up slightly, and I, the nerves because I didn't play a huge amount of junior squash at all. I think I used to get quite nervous compared to a lot of my contemporaries who played a lot through the younger age. Do you think if refs had played the game to a high level, they would make the same decisions? I think I think it would really help them. I think it would really help them. Um, you know, John Mazzarella, the Don, um, who who is is, is like a, an umpa lumper on steroids. He's he's a great guy. Um, he's really very knowledgeable and very professional. Um, but I do feel with the refs that to have to to being under that stress and movement, it's the movement factor really of what you can get back when the adrenaline's surging and what you're able to do, and mm. um, also the sneakiness of players, which still happens even though they're very exposed on squash TV if they're getting up to tricks with yeah, doubles. Uh, you know, as an ex-player, I, I, I would hopefully Archie, there'll be a scenario where the money will come into the sport more and more, and ex-players would be more. Yeah. Entitled to look to do that as a career, travel the world to these beautiful places and, and ref these top guys under a lot of pressure, but but deal with it, you know. And and, and more of an incentive. Yeah, I, the refereeing has improved massively though over the last period. It's huge, huge improvements. But I would, yeah, uh, yeah. In the future, I'd like to see kind of ex players um, giving it a bit of a go as well. But having the guidance from from you know the the, the kind of real. Uh, experienced campaigners such as Roy Gingell and and John Mazzarella and others as well that can mm. kind of and, and can, you know kind of chaperone them a bit and because it's not easy you, you might although you played the game you might have played the game you've also got to they're presenting as well so these, yeah. these referees they're, they're under pressure they're having to say the score they're introducing the matches the games they're actually presenting and they are on TV you know they're on the spotlight yeah yeah so, that takes a skill. Um, I think Jason Foster's doing a good job. He's an ex-player of a very, very good, good high level. Who, who um, is he? Did a lot of Canary Wharf, and I feel that he's he's got a, an interesting future if he wants to pursue it. Mm. So hopefully he'll lead lead the kind of way for some of these other ex-players to to go down that route, Archie. Mm. So moving on then to you as a as a commentator for the PSA, what's been the most embarrassing blooper? Live on on uh, PSA TV. It's <laughs> got so many. <laughs> this be? It was, there's been so many. Um, uh, I mean, I, I don't want to go into too many secrets, but I mm. mean, mm. I think I think that you know I've got a thing with names, so I'm I'm relatively tuned in with names. But I've always always had the giggles when people get names wrong of people or get the wrong person yeah. name. It's always something that sends me over the edge. I mean, I have had. Um, with with PJ particularly multiple times where we are battling like there's no tomorrow to to not completely and utterly you know uh, soak ourselves in laughter tears um, live on camera. Yeah, yeah. 
th there was a time, uh, and this was actually quite serious, where we were presenting the world uh, world tour finals in Dubai, and it was massive, big TV setup, amazing setup. It was at the Dubai Golf Club, mm. and we you know, we were all in, into it. The crowd were listening. We we're all live going on these networks, and my talk back. My talk back battery ran out, so I had to do the whole kind of opening, just by by just my feel of what's going on uh, with all the counts, the different announces, to different clips that have been played on the screens, highlights, player intros, and it was that kind of. I thought after that, if I can, if I and I got away with it, and if I could do that, then that was you know kind of gave me a lot of confidence. Mm. Uh, but yeah, I mean we've had we've had a lot of funny stuff. Uh, that's gone on um, the, the, the carry scenario which I think is on YouTube when PJ explains the carry um, and gets very very kind of uh, um, uh, sidetracked with the carry that, that I'm just basically howling with with laughter as he's trying to be serious <laughs> I mean that's, <laughs> that's going live on TV so um, uh, you know it's it, you've got to have that bit of fun you know you've got to yeah. get your marks right but you've got to have fun because it's it's a sport at the end of the day and um, you need to have a bit of a sense of humour otherwise things get a bit desperate. Who do you think will be world number one in the next five years? Great question. Again, um, for the men, I think there's a very good opportunity for somebody like Mustafa Asal. Also, Diego Elias, if he gets his act together and, and gets his discipline and his body stronger and his mind mentally focused. He's got more talent than any of them uh, for me to prove humor. Uh, he's got a great opportunity to, to be a world number one in the next period. So those two, I would probably be lining up a little bit, I would say. Mm -hmm. And for the female? For the female, I mean, it's got to be the Egyptian girls. I mean, there's so many of them. And, um, you know, you've got the young El Hamami and, and Rowan El Arabi. Shabini's still, although she's had a lot of injuries and her body's kind of war weary, she's still very young as well. Um, but it depends how she can get body healthy. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, I, 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 the women, the focus for me really is purely on the Egyptians uh, coming into that world number one phase. Mm -hmm. And what's the biggest player meltdown you've ever seen? <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> oh wow! Well, I've, uh, I've seen a few, Archie. I've seen a few. I've what, seen a few. What, what comes to mind? Uh, I, I'm, I do remember Ferris Dasuki playing Rami Shaw in in Cairo in the World Championships. The one that Kareem Abdul Gawad ended up winning, and he they were, he was playing very well, very talented Ferris Dasuki, obviously, and he was really getting stuck into Rami Shaw, but wasn't quite there. And there was a couple of decisions that weren't particularly odd, and Ferris kind of lost the plot and started crying. On court, yeah, yeah. Um, that you know, that to me is a your ultimate meltdown, really. Um, <laughs> yeah, toys out the pram, everything. Go yeah, on. yeah. The racket, you know, after the racket ended up disappearing off about fifty meters. Uh, hopefully, it didn't decapitate somebody in the street, but he let his racket. But it was more the crying and the breakdown. I've never seen that before. I, I could never, for me, like. I can imagine what it's you know winning a World Cup or something in, in football or one of those things you, you break down in tears if there's an emotional thing but that's if you won I, I think I don't know I don't know I don't think I'd be crying losing a squash match I'd be unbelievably angry mm. and be, be nuts in that way but the tear factor doesn't really come into it when I'm angry <laughs> yeah moving on now to the fire questions you can answer yes no or no comment all right okay sir cool have you ever faked an injury? Never. Have you ever given up in a match? Absolutely not. Have you ever hoped someone loses a match so you don't have to play them in the next round? Yes. <laughs> Do you think you maximised your squash ability? Um, yes and no. Yes and no. That's got to be a double whammy for me for that. And have you lied at any point during this round? No. <laughs> okay, great. Moving on now to the personality questions. If you could invite three people to a dinner party, past or present, who would they be and why? For squash or anything? Anything. Oh, that's a really, really, really brilliant question. Gosh, I mean, uh, God. I'd probably invite Julius Caesar. Uh, I'd invite... Uh, 
Steve Prefontaine, maybe. Um, and probably Muhammad Ali. So good three. If you were an alcoholic drink, what drink would you be and why? Well, it's got to be, it's got to be cider. It's got to be cider coming from Somerset. Um, be very tasty. Um, some good bubbles that uh, keep you perky and, and, and definitely put a smile on your face. Mm -hmm. What's the greatest sporting moment you've ever seen live outside of squash? Uh, uh, God, so many. Um, probably football-wise, I remember I wasn't a Man United supporter, but I remember when Man United beat uh, his Bayern Munich in the, to win the Champions League. I fell off a table, um, not intentionally, but uh, nearly broke my arm. But that was pretty unbelievable. Oh, <laughs> that was amazing. Way. Yeah, that was amazing. But uh, that, you know, really for me, um, the tennis matches between Nadal and and, uh, and Federer put my hair on end. Some of the rugby matches that I've seen, and you know, and so much. I mean, I, you know, I do love my sport, and I used to watch a lot growing up. So it's a great question. I um, so much sport, but this is what sport brings to people. You know, it, it gives you something that's just extra, extra special when you're when you're watching it, to have those feelings when something amazing happens is, is the best thing around. Mm -hmm. And who is the most famous person in your contacts? Apart from my dad, I'd probably say Brad Pitt. Brad Pitt's in your contacts? <laughs> it's genuinely oh. Brad Pitt's in your contacts? Wait and see, you might get a message from him one day. Oh, awesome. Okay, so now we're going to do a similar thing like we did with the fire questions but we're going to do it with squash players' names. So I'm going to give you a, a, a variety of squash player names, and you have to give me one word to describe them. Okay. All right? Okay. So, Sam Todd. Tall. Nick Matthew. Persistent. Shabana. Cool. Marwan El Shabagi. Clever. And finally... Jonah Barrington. Legend. And finally, to finish off, if you could ask yourself one question, what would it be? Um, about squash or anything. Anything. Why did you drink so much at university? Okay, very interesting one. And it, are there any questions you'd like to ask me? Yeah. Um, Who's your favourite squash player? I don't have like one favourite. I do very much like Ali Farag because mm -hmm. uh, mainly actually not because not just because of his quality in squash. Obviously that's you know impeccable, but um, he, his his attitude to to his fans and on court, yeah, the way he the way he carries himself is is very good. So I'd probably say I'd probably say Ali. And what would you what would you do to make squash um, more appealing to the masses on TV? Oh, uh, what would I do? I would for TV, or just for, or just to get people more interested in sport in general. Yeah, for TV, so they're watching it at home. They flick on the channel, squash comes up. You know, what do you think is, is what do you think could be added to, to the TV show for Squash to get people actually not flicking over to the next channel and, and wanting to, to watch and, 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 and look into the sport? I'd probably get um, something like this on the channel uh, as like a separate series for PSA. And I mean that in terms of, you know, for, uh, for juniors and I've said this I said this a couple of times in the interview but for juniors watching this who who you know love not even playing squash who love racket sports and um, maybe interested in squash or have seen squash and you know looked over it but then watched this and then thought a bit more about squash I think that's really good uh, for pushing the pushing the sport forward in terms of the popularity of the sport um, because I genuinely do think um, words words like these do mean a lot to people my age and even younger juniors watching this trying to make it through and 
make it through as a as a professional or just or just trying to play the sport in general. Sure. Yeah, I agree with you. So guys, that is the end of the interview. Thanks so much for watching. Thank you so much, uh, Joey, for joining me today. And as per usual, please don't forget to like, subscribe, and turn on post notifications so you don't miss a future video on this channel. Joey's socials will be linked in the description. Uh, PSA will also be linked in the description. And uh, yeah, I will see you guys in the next one.